Well, hello, everyone. I'm Brooks Rayford, president of the North Carolina Technology Association, or NC Tech. And I'd like to welcome you to today's NC Tech Talk. NC Tech has been working to include virtual sessions as part of our overall programming, uh, but the current stay at home orders have accelerated that plan and provided us with the opportunity to uh, shift to a more of a virtual approach, virtual approach in general. And to that end, we've built uh, several different online offerings, including our NC Tech Talk uh, series, where we engage with key leaders from across North Carolina to talk about what's on their mind and how their organization is adapting to today's environment. We've had a great response to these sessions, so thank you for taking time to join us. We are recording today's conversation and we'll send you a link uh, as a follow up. Over the past few years, North Carolina has become a hotbed for tech startups, many of which have seen tremendous growth and success. One of those success stories has been bandwidth based in Raleigh. We're excited to have with us today David Morkin, who's founder and CEO, here with us today to share their story and talk a bit about how they're managing through our current circumstances. Our format today will start with welcoming remarks from our sponsor, and then I'll take it from there and ask David several prepared questions. We invite you to use the chat function. Uh, I'll be monitoring that during our discussion today, and we'll toss in some questions as we have time. To kick things off, I'd like to thank the sponsor for today's program, AHEAD, and invite their client director, Will Moncrief, to say a few words of welcome. Will, welcome. Yeah, thank you, Brooks, and uh, thank you, Tracy, for uh, coordinating the NC Tech Talk. And thank you for all that are attending, and we hope that we have a great contribution from the uh, participants. A little bit about AHEAD, I'm li I live here in Charlotte. AHEAD is, uh, is founded in 2007. We have roughly 600 employees. I'm one of about 20 right here in North Carolina. And kind of our core pillars of our, the fabric of our company is helping propelling, propelling transform, digital transformation uh, forward by doing some of the three pillars that I'll just review quickly. We moderate, modernize infrastructure, architecting deploying workloads across public clouds, data centers, and edge locations based on requirements specific to your digital business. We create cloud native applications, delivering better software faster while simultaneously reducing the complexity of your development pipeline. And then lastly, um, we help technology organizations run smarter, integrating service management, monitoring and analytics platforms to improve your efficiency, user experience and security. Thank you again, Brooks, for having us participate. And I look forward to a great session. Great, thank you, Will, and thank you to AHEAD, your supporter of the association across the board, and we're grateful for that. Um, so, David, you uh, you started bandwidth back uh, decades ago, I guess, in the spare bedroom of your home, I think I read, and although maybe uh, struggled to figure things out the first few years, you and your team remain nimble. You always morphed bandwidth offerings to match the world's changing technology demands, and You've chosen to grow your business in a disciplined manner with focus on growth and profitability. You debuted on NASDAQ in November of 17, uh, and with became the first tech IPO from the Triangle in three years. And since the IPO, the company has posted impressive results. I think you're up 500% since you opened. And uh, you've also recently announced plans to build a new headquarters here in Raleigh and add over a thousand new jobs, which has been very welcome news in today's current climate. I want to really thank you for making the time to be with us today and welcome to NC Tech Talk. Thanks very much, Brooks. And as all of us have started many video conferences, can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. I'm glad we can hear each other. That's good. That's, that's a good first start. <laughs> I want to make note, David, as we begin, uh, we're broadcasting this session live on June the 3rd, and we'll share recording a recording of this in our video library for future viewing. So I wanted to acknowledge the issue that's gripping the country and really the world right now, which is the murder of George Floyd and the underlying issue of how minorities are treated by law enforcement in particular and by society at large. And I just wonder if you have any observations to share on this. Well, thanks, Brooks. Thanks for the opportunity. I think the only human response possible to the scenes we witnessed uh, are shock and horror, the abuse of power in the taking of innocent life should horrify. Uh, and I, I, I don't think there's any other response possible. I think we're all also shocked by the violent riots that have happened. And universally, we all know two wrongs don't make a right. 
And so it's been a tumultuous time and I think prayer for unity and peace and good principled leadership is at a premium right now. It is indeed. It's uh, it's an issue for all of us to think about and uh, and um, contemplate what our role can be. Uh, I'll just say for those who are seeing this sometime either live now or sometime in the coming weeks, NC Tech is hosting. Uh, we had planned this actually last year for for this year, our first ever diversity and inclusion in tech summit. It's taking place on June the 23rd and 24th. Uh, virtual summit. We were going to have it live, but what's well, going to be live, but we were going to have it in person and now it will be a virtual one. And one of the advantages of virtual is actually that you can, uh, if you had come in person, you would have had to pick some breakouts to go to since some of those are concurrent and you would have missed the other ones, but now it's virtual. Everything will be filmed and you can watch and listen in on all of it at your leisure um, during and after the program is broadcast. So actually there's a more content available in this in this uh, method than had it been in person. So I'd encourage our listeners to visit nctech.org and check that out. We have quite a lineup arranged for you. So David, I wanna go back to the beginning. Um, so uh, when, when you went public in 2017, you were quoted as saying that the company was a 20 year overnight success. <laughs> and since then, Vanwith has continued to grow. Not everybody is familiar with the company. It's a very familiar word, which you were very smart enough to understand when you bought the domain the, the, many, many years ago. But uh, give us the brief overview of the founding and history of the company, uh, sort of the elevator description, and then uh, more broadly, tell us a bit about how you and your team built a foundation for success and how that's positioned you all to weather things like the COVID-19 situation. You bet, Brooks. Uh, I began the company in 1999, um, leaving active duty in the Marine Corps where I was a judge advocate and uh, moved in with my parents and I had a growing family with my fourth child on the way and we sacrificed and for the first two years made it work just barely before teaming up with Henry Kaysner, who became my best friend and business partner really for the next uh, eight straight years. And together right here in North Carolina, beginning in 2001, we focused on serving business customers, small and medium business customers initially by providing internet connectivity. The marketplace for finding internet connectivity uh, really didn't exist at the time. And we grew that business to the point where we recognized we could do more than just provide internet connectivity. We could provide the office voice services for businesses. And so we began providing that and ultimately beginning in 2007, built out a nationwide network and software platform on which many of today's uh, most immersive work from home voice and video services uh, are supported. So we uh, today at any one time during the business day, we may be uh, through dialing into a Zoom conference or dialing into a Cisco WebEx like this, uh, the voice component, or if you're a Ring Central customer, your office phone system will support anywhere from a million to three million people on those conferences, many of whom are dialing in. And that's that's been a, uh, a real um, remarkable season for us, but it all began very modestly and humbly. And it, it is indeed now my 21st year of just trying to serve customers more effectively every year. Great. Uh, you mentioned WebEx. Actually, they are our video partner for this series. So I appreciate you uh, giving me a chance to check that out. <laughs> <laughs> my pleasure. All companies and organizations have had to pivot fairly suddenly, uh, like us, and I'm sure like you, in various ways over the past few months, just in terms of how we operate, how we work together, and still deliver for our uh, clients, uh, customers, and audience. What do you see as the greatest success that you've seen within bandwidth during this period of time that was sort of thrust upon us? You know, our, our greatest success is really two, Brooks. The first is overnight when everyone had to work from home, our large customers uh, like Google, like Microsoft, uh, like Amazon, like Cisco WebEx, like Zoom, they all had extraordinary spikes in usage, in demand. So our greatest success is a tribute to the leadership of Scott Mullen and Morali Mendicana and many others on the, on the network side who scaled in real time through constant interaction with Verizon Wireless and AT&T and the peers that we have on the network side. The software platform that is how our customers engage with us also scaled quickly. And so the greatest success was 
keeping up. And it was all hands on deck for uh, days during the beginning of this. And I'm inordinately proud of what that team accomplished. The second success, and then I'll certainly get into the challenge, um, was our own infrastructure that supports our over 800 people. Cade Ross is our CIO. And years ago, we mandated together that the company wouldn't have anything in the building required for us to do our mission. If the building burned to the ground, we would be able to serve our customers and work with each other. And so when this occurred, it was other than a hurricane season, the first real wide scale long term test of that policy and Cade's execution and his team were flawless and we were all transitioned to home uh, even though we are an essential business and we had a network operations center functioning here it went really really well um, but if I could speak to the challenge that I think all of us face uh, for us it is maintaining the relationships into which we have deposited positive balances over the years together with the culture of our company. But when you're remote, when you're separated, when you're distant, the biggest challenge is simply maintaining those vital relationships that you have across teams. It's hard to do that remotely. Um, you can't, you know, we, we say work from home. Can you imagine saying, yeah, we're going to do home from work? No, that doesn't work. You need to be in person. Similarly, there's a relationship challenge, I think, that's for all of us. Yeah, actually, that ties into what I was going to ask you next. Do you, you have talked uh, in the past, some sessions we've had with you, and you've alluded to it here, how deliberate you and your team have been in building your corporate culture. Uh, that's done primarily in person. So now you are looking to hire a lot of people, and you may be hiring a lot of people without ever meeting them in person at least for a while, to so share a bit more about how do you uh, maintain the culture that you've built with those who are with you? How do you relay that culture and, and, and instill that culture in people who join you in a remote fashion in the first place? It is so hard. If there are others on this call struggling, I get it, I'm, I relate. Orientation is a perfect example, Brooks. We've continued to hire during this season uh, because of the needs and opportunities that we have. and so. The onboarding orientation is uh, an early morning that I get excited about because I get to meet 5, 10, 20 new people, get to know them personally, where they come from, what they're excited about. And it's an hour or so in person that is their first day at bandwidth. And, and I love it. It's a blast. We've been uh, doing those like this via screens and it's tough. It's not easy. Similarly, our, our intern program uh, we we maintained, and I will say, since so many internship programs around the country had to be canceled, we've got the happiest group of about 25 college uh, grads and grad school uh, folks. They are fired up, and so that was a fun one. But I had a real moment when I realized how universal the video nature of work has become when at the end of the orientation for the interns, I said, Thanks everybody. And I went like this and instantly 25 simultaneous waves like this in every window. I'm like, whoa, everyone's way too good at that. Uh, we need to be working in person again soon. Yeah, I think we're all anxious for that. And I think also that's a personality thing. If you're like me and you really enjoy interacting with people, it's hard to do it from a screen 100% of the time and feel like you're complete. <laughs> I, You know what? I think that's a a great sign of health. And here's what I mean. Being effective, being efficient, being productive is not enough. You, you shine light into your coworkers and colleagues' lives when you are with them. And that's part of being a colleague. And it's hard, it's hard to do remote. It's not just about efficiency. It's not just about productivity. It's about contributing into the vitality of your colleagues. And that's, I mean, Brooks, when I'm with you, you bring energy, you bring light. And to the screen, I'm sorry, man, it's just not quite the same. Not quite the same. I'll try to animate a little better. <laughs> uh, I want to remind our audience to please submit questions if you have any through the chat function. I'll keep an eye on that. And then we'll w w work those in as we have time or they, uh, come up in terms of uh, relevance as we discuss things through here. A little side note here um, uh, for you, David, and for the audience, we've been conducting a poll of uh, tech 
sort of leadership within our organization over the past couple months, going to our board of directors, our board of advisors, and so on. It's several hundred people. Um, not all are tech executives, but they play in the tech space, either they're professional services firms that serve tech clients, that sort of thing, but it's a good mix. And we've been asking them twice monthly a series of 10 questions just to see what the, uh, the shift in sentiment is over time on those questions. And we'll be doing this through the end of June, and then we're going to pivot to a different format and, and, and a whole other um, approach for that. But this period of time, it's the same poll. And one of the questions we ask is uh, what are the last question that we ask actually is an open ended question where they can type anything and it's what has the been what's been the biggest challenge in the last couple of weeks since this whole uh, work from home environment has come about well there were certain answers that were um, that came up at the end of march when we started the poll and it was early in all of this that have been consistent we talked about one just now that is the lack of in-person meetings and interaction and so forth uh, people talk about the challenge of onboarding in, an, in a remote environment. Uh, they talk about the, um, the challenge of forecasting when you have no idea what's going on with the economy. Uh, how, do you, how do you drive new business? All those things. But among the things we ask um, is, are some questions around the work from home uh, uh, policies or practices and how much people think that's going to become the new normal or how much they think it will return to pre-COVID um, levels. And or how much how many of them think it'll be more of a blend of the two and it's very strong feeling it'll become the new normal, perhaps not 100% like now, but a lot more than the 7% of people who work from home before there'll be some some uh, blend there. But among those open ended comments we were hearing uh, lately are concern about the mental health of their employees concern about uh, productivity, which was high at first, maybe seeming to wane as time was on for a group that's not accustomed to all working from home. It's one thing if that's been your norm, you've adapted to it, you've done it for years, that's one thing. But when you're thrust into it and it's all new to you and you may not even have the right equipment, I mean, it's, it's a challenge. And so I'm just curious if you have any comments on that. I, I, I think you are onto something that is real. We see it also when folks decide in video conferences to dial in instead of doing video. If video just gets too overwhelming after 25 video conferences, I'm just going to dial in so I can walk around outside. So there's, there's fatigue as it relates to uh, working through the screen, but there's absolutely a limit for all of us to the amount of time we can work in an isolated way with our colleagues. And I do not for a second believe that we will have a new normal, which is uh, everyone working from home most of the time. It is, it is my view that collaboration and inventive business and sacrificial working together requires people to gather together. Does that mean that there won't be perhaps more flexibility for life and family needs? Uh, no, there will almost certainly be new tools that we're now familiar with that we can use, but it was 7% before, maybe it goes to 14, um, mm -hmm. but I, I don't for a second think this begins something that runs against the, the fundamentals of human collaboration historically. That's probably true. I, I do think a blend is more likely where you're able to accommodate people's, uh, the needs of their personal lives and work life and the, the balance of that perhaps a little more uh, openly uh, after all this is over. Yep. All right, let's do something exciting and positive. You made headlines recently when you announced that you'll be building a new headquarters. You bought a big chunk of land or at least an expensive one <laughs> and you're going to be uh, doubling your workforce, maybe more than that. Uh, probably the best business news we've seen in a number of weeks around here. How did you and your leadership team work together to build a plan to not only survive during these challenging times, but to thrive in them? Great question. The growth trajectory that we're on um, really began years ago, but more recently we raised public capital and put that capital to work to grow from 375 to now over 800 people. And we realize we have even more opportunity. We've put that money to work effectively and we've got a good line of sight to our future being a positive one. And so we began working with the state on how we could remain in North Carolina and not move somewhere else. 
And we were fired up that the state recognized the trajectory that we were on and provided an incentive that we only will get as we hire these additional thousand plus people over the next eight years. But we've uh, we've got a good head of steam, public capital we've put to work, huge market opportunity worldwide, and a home base now secure in North Carolina. So while that land was expensive, I would describe it as high value. Uh, it's it's a great piece of ground on which we want to invest in our people, in our team, in our ability to serve thousands of customers and millions of people. And so we're actively working on the nature of that campus environment, how it best serves the needs of our people. And it's exciting simultaneously to have um, a hiring plan that is positive that the state has gotten behind, but then also to come alongside the Department of Agriculture and provide parking for the state fair and to buy that piece of ground on which we can continue to grow in the state. So I, I am really fired up about the collaboration and partnership with the state for all of us at Bandwidth. We have been a North Carolina story for the last 19 years, and here's to 20 more. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I'm glad to hear you say that. We work with the state quite a bit. In fact, some state agencies and organizations are members of the association, including uh, the Department of Transportation, including the um, the Department of IT, and uh, also including uh, the Commerce Group. And so uh, one thing I hear said a lot by the Secretary of Commerce and others involved in that area of the state's work is that it's typically assumed that the only thing the Commerce Department focuses on is attracting companies to come to North Carolina, and that's certainly part of what they do. Uh, but you know, the, the jobs are really created, and the net jobs are created by existing employers, and the things we can do to help our homegrown or those who, like you came here early on and grew here is to really focus on the companies we have and make sure that they have the environment in which to grow and thrive and, and where, where governor can be a government can be a partner or at least help get barriers out of the way. That's great, great to, uh, to hear. It's effective. We have every reason now to hire not in our Denver office and not in our New York office, but to hire right here. And that's a credit to the state. Right. Great to hear. Um, you know, recently you talked earlier a bit about the, the demand for your um, what you offer as a, as a product or a service has soared during this time. A recent article explained a bit about that, saying that bandwidth has seen a surge in revenue and in stock price, I'm guessing, over the past few months because the spike in virtual meetings means a spike in phone use, which drives revenue for bandwidth. So uh, do you see a return to a more typical usage and what impact does that have? on revenues for you. How do you plan for whatever's next after COVID-19 allows us to go back to work, back to the office, I should say? On our Q1 uh, earnings call, Brooks, we told the world that we were forecasting the tailwind from work from home to only continue through the end of June and that we were assuming for purposes of our forecast uh, that July through December, we would have a return to historical levels of usage. We have seen the return to work goes slower than expected and the tailwinds have continued through May um, and we would expect through June. But after that, we believe that it's the prudent, responsible thing to continue to forecast a return to normal July through the end of the year. One of the reasons I think that's important is because while we have a tailwind, there are also 40 million people out of work. So instead of it being work from home, the new normal, there's work from home versus no work at all as the new normal. And that's a huge issue. And it's so difficult to understand how that reconciles through the rest of the year. Um, we know that it's our mission to serve those that we have to the best of our ability. And we forecast as accurately as we can, uh, but we'll see what happens. Well, you touched on this in an earlier question, but this is, I think, a good time to ask it kind of back to what is bandwidth and what do you do? A little, can you give us, what was it that you first offered as a business model? What, and then you morphed over time and, and then explained exactly what it is you do now. So that why is it that phone usage soaring is what drives your um, revenues when your customers are people like Google and so forth? I'm not sure everyone can wrap their head around that. I think one of our strategic advantages is that, the, is that it's very hard to figure out what kind of plumbing we provide. It's one of our moats that are, that's hard to cross, so don't feel bad about that. Um, we have a software platform and a nationwide network, but we only get paid for four different things. 
minutes of use on that voice network for the phone calls. The phone numbers, we get paid monthly for using phone numbers. If it's a phone number for life for Google or a conference calling number or a toll free number for an advertiser. So minutes of use, phone numbers, 911 enablement when we uh, have a number that 911 can serve and then text messages. Those are the four things we make money on. So when business is conducted face to face, we make nothing. <laughs> it is only when there's voice conversations, text conversations, emergency service dispatch, that's when we make revenue. And I want a return to normal pre work from home era as much as anyone. But during this time, ironically, we've been blessed in terms of our business model. Well, if my experience is any indication, I think when we all get back to meeting in person, that's not going to stop the texting during meetings. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you're right. Much, much as I try. Anyway, uh, well, good, good. Thank you for that uh, little update on on uh, sort of how you have changed your business over time to what it is today. Um, this is a question that's easy to ask and harder to answer, but I don't know how far in advance of shifts that you've made, you could see that shift coming. But as you... You see where you are today and you look ahead you know what are there areas that you can share anyway of what you're looking at or areas where you think um, there's there's room for innovation or growth that bandwidth can be part of we are focused on international as the next largest addressable market for bandwidth we've opened up physical infrastructure in london and frankfurt and have our platform and network built out and are working now to extend those services and fully complete them for our enterprise customers. So international beginning in the EU and then around the world is what we believe to be the most important uh, future strategic imperative that we have. We do have a terrific R&D team that are working on different experiences in call center environments using WebRTC for video. Uh, and doing some exciting things that may expand the product platform more significantly than we have in the past when we were resource constrained, but international remains the primary path for us next. Gotcha. Well, that's that's a big that is a big addressable market. One would think that someone's doing what you're doing over there already. What's what's your pathway into the market? In the U.S., it's helpful to answer that question by understanding who it is we compete with here. In the U.S., we compete with Verizon, AT&T, uh, CenturyLink, and it's because we have a software platform that we win when we compete against them. Creative software teams in Silicon Valley and elsewhere love to work with bandwidth because they can use our API, uh, our SDK, and create a user experience, and they don't need to know anything about what's under the hood. And AT&T, Verizon, CenturyLink do not have a software platform that can compete with ours. Internationally, we're similarly competing with incumbent providers who have a legacy history that's not in software. And so whether it's um, Tata, Colt, or others, they are competitors that we welcome and we think we will be able to, to do well against them. Understood, makes sense. Um, I'll touch back again on work from home, but in a different way. The governor, as you know, has announced that the second phase of the state's reopening is underway. That is currently scheduled to go through uh, June the 22nd. Uh, there will then be a phase three where even further restrictions are lifted and great numbers of people can gather. Um, obviously, the data between now and then will drive how fast or how long that takes to do. Um, but with all that in mind, can you share a bit about uh, bandwidth strategy for return to office? Are there new technologies or broader uh, use of technologies by your team uh, that you're offering or policies that you're implementing that will help that work uh, both in the near term and sustained? I want to begin by saying that we're really fortunate that our business can be conducted entirely remote. I know there are many businesses where the, the challenges returning are, are fundamentally different, and I don't want to lose sight of that. For us, we are an essential business that has remained open every day during this period, and we have for our personnel kept the office open uh, but said to our team it's voluntary as to whether or not you want to come back into the office environment during this period it's up to you what's most important to us is that you don't have anxiety and that you're 
both effective, productive, efficient, but also psychologically and spiritually, you're at peace in the environment where you're working. If you want to come back, you may. But if you don't want to, for any reason, please remain at home. Uh, we know we can accomplish our mission remote. We are doing extra cleaning. Our layout as an office is uh, out. It's it's wide enough beyond the interior parameters for distancing. Uh, so we've been fortunate in that we have an interior that's compliant and and we've got extra cleaning. But we don't want to require everyone to come back to the office so long as we can accomplish our mission. I do think that it is vital that we. Um, aspire to all return to collaborate well for the mental health reasons we talked about Brooks for the vitality that each person on our team adds to each other beyond their day job beyond their straightforward objectives it's how they bless those around them that contributes to being a great team and so we think that happens over time voluntarily so long as the health of our team at home remains intact uh, but that's our approach, and it's it's very much focused on the well-being of our team. Well, if I could ask a practical uh, question, given that you're about to uh, build a new space for yourself, uh, one of the things that I've, I've talked to other site leaders or CEOs of companies that have a, a large, relatively large staff, and density has been the name of the game over recent years, where you're trying to get more people per um, square foot or whatever the case may be in an office space, which has led to some very close proximity in terms of layout, whether it's hoteling or bench working or all the different terms you hear, close cubicles and so forth. Since you're starting with all of this in the rear view mirror, when you start construction, has it changed over your these last few weeks, changed what your uh, design looks like, what your density will look like? At the center of our design for our campus is something called Ohana. And Ohana is a three-month-old to five-year-old on-site integrated Montessori school. And if you want to understand how crazy we are, we're taking on the challenge of that in the context of hygiene and cleanliness and everything else. We're gonna have kids. You're gonna hear children laughing on the breeze as you walk in and out of your workspace. How in the world do we reconcile that with the current context? We think this is temporary. We don't expect to return to jammed open office environments. And in fact, we've maintained a much more open environment historically, precisely because we don't think that the humanity is served by overcrowding. Nothing has changed in the fundamental approach to how we think about space when we're building going forward. We were already providing enough distance, um, but there are things we think that that may be exciting to consider as a result of um, of really the the potential for more people to work from home. I think the bar is going to be raised on office environments if people are going to voluntarily work in the office as opposed to being at home. And I don't just mean perks, I mean real fundamental contributions to quality of life. And that for us includes Ohana and having our team, uh, whether it's a young mom no longer having to do a walk of shame at 430 to pick up a child because the child development center is far away and she has to leave her software development team before anyone else because she has that parental duty. When you're integrated and on site, it can be both healthily subsidized, but also the proximity is just incredible. So we're, we're trying to do amazing things for our team, for quality of life as a campus, as an office. And that, to your good point, Brooks, includes where do you sit and work? If you're going deep into the matrix to do code, can we provide for you an environment that is more protected for focused work, for deep work? Um, and we think the answer is yes. Sounds like you're going to have uh, great recruiting uh, messaging when the time comes to build all these jobs out. We're getting near the end of our, our scheduled time. And I want to ask you uh, kind of a closing question. I'll preface it with another reference to our poll uh, that we've been doing. Among the questions we asked are, when do you see the economy rebounding and what type of rebound do you anticipate seeing? And the choices we give them are, you know, pick a month in which you think uh, you've in which you believe that the rebound will start to be noticeable, to be measurable improvement in the fundamentals of the economy. 
And the other, the, the companion question is, uh, what type of recovery might you predict we'll have? And then we give them four choices. There's the V-shaped where there's this precipitous downfall, but then it's a quick pivot and tremendous up, upswing to follow. There's the U-shape, which assumes a bit of a longer lull when it bottoms out, but then strong upward trajectory. Uh, there's a W, which a lot of people are talking about these days, which is there's the downfall we're having now. There'll be an uptick when uh, work, when in-person gatherings can start to happen again and businesses open again. But then there may be a rebound of the virus in the winter, let's say, and there could be another downturn that follows briefly before a true long-term improvement occurs. That also would coincide with vaccine probably and some other things. So that's the W. And then one we don't like to talk about is an L where we go down and then stay there for a long time. Um, the polling we've done has shown a really strong inclination to think it's gonna be some form of the U, U or V, uh, with the next strongest answer being the W. Uh, thankfully, not many in our world think it's going to be an L. Um, and the months that the, from the time we started the poll in the end of March to the most recent one at the end of May, the prediction of when will the rebound start has shifted later and looks more like the sentiment among business leaders is third quarter will be signs of improvement with fourth quarter being more mar more marked improvement that's sustained and really uh, meaningful. That does square with what some of the economists have shared in some other sessions we have offered. So first of all, speak to that. How would you answer that poll question or those poll questions? It's a really hard question. When we see the, the, the precipitous drop in employment end, mm -hmm. we still be months away when we see employment and productivity get back to where we were pre-COVID, a long time. I mean, we were on a steep, historic growth trajectory when this hit. The likelihood that we achieve, Brooks, that angle of trajectory coming out of this, no time soon. And I'm terrified about what this period of time does to what Alan Greenspan once called you know, the animal spirits of capitalists that are out there. Or in the 2008 crisis, it was the green shoots that are supposed to pop up and re in the spring that's going to happen. I am most concerned about what this has done to the spirit of those who we require to drive us forward. And I don't know what shape of letter I would choose, perhaps since I compete with them, Verizon's logo, which is steep decline and then long, slow V out. So that's the shape I'd pick. Or the Nike swoosh, maybe something like that. <laughs> that's even, that's even, since I'm, I'm watching the last episode of The Last Dance tonight, I'm a little bit late. Uh, the swoosh is even better. There you go. There you go. Well, thank you for all those insights. You have a lot going on and um, a lot to manage that sort of came about suddenly, but uh, you seem, you and your team seem well positioned to do it. And uh, we're grateful for you spending a bit of time with us. I just want to say that before we adjourn today, um, I would like to invite all the listeners to check our website for updated and new offerings at nctech.org slash events. You'll find there a lineup of uh, all of our upcoming programs uh, for the rest of the year, including this series, NC Tech Talks. We have a mixture of leaders among them. I'll just off the top of my head mention a few. We have the person who heads up all IPOs at the New York Stock Exchange, uh, talking about the exchange's view of the tech sector, uh, what's happening, what will be happening in the economy, and so forth. We have a joint session with the mayors of Raleigh and Charlotte, talking about how cities are impacted by uh, the COVID-19 situation from a health standpoint, public health, and also ec economically, uh, revenues to the city, obviously uh, diminished and still having services to provide. Um, so we have some really interesting sessions coming up. Encourage you to take a look at the calendar and, and uh, register for those as you see fit. I want to thank again our friends at Ahead for sponsoring the session. Uh, David Morgan, thank you for your time and expertise today. I uh, love the headset. I uh, hope your son gets it one day soon. <laughs> and uh, to all of our viewers, uh, thank you for joining us today.